friends of the Crawford Gallery, uh, Bernadette here, working from home, enjoying every minute of it. But uh, during our during our corkabouts, uh, Michelle and I came upon a wonderful piece in the Fitzgerald's Park here in the city by stone sculptor James Horn. And I'm very pleased to let you know that uh, James has agreed to have a chat with me here this morning. So welcome, James, to Friends of the Crawford Gallery. How are you doing today? I'm good. Good morning, uh, Bernadette. Good morning, Friends of the Crawford. It's a pleasure to be here with you in isolation. We're delighted, <laughs> delighted to have you in your studio. Uh, James, should, you know, introduce yourself. Tell us a little bit about yourself with the Friends. Well, I went to the Crawford College, so I, I kind of uh, spent 11 years in Cork after that. Uh, and I just became, I, I found stone carving in the Crawford and I never stopped. Uh, in the last year or so, I've started using bronze, but it's still mostly stone, mostly stone all the time. And figurative work, uh, the piece in the Fitzgerald's Park kind of happened, I think that was 2006 or seven. it was made and it was installed in the park shortly after. I, I gifted it to the park. Nice. Um, just to get rid of them, you know, <laughs> just to get rid of them. Just to have it. It's a lovely place, you know, with Seamus Murphy's work there and everything. It's a great place to have, to can tell you have a piece, you know, it's nice to be in such company. Absolutely. Um, it's called it's Reflections, excuse me. Yeah, yeah. Reflections. And if the friends go walking into Fitzgerald's Park, it's located now down around by the, the spheres and, and the children's playground beside the Cork Public Museum. Which was probably a while since you've been there. I haven't seen it in that location actually. The last time I was down in Fitzgerald's Park was it was still a kind of the front of the museum, but they redid all of that, the, the back the back area of that, and it um, so they moved it down there. I believe it was nearly hidden by a bush, and it looked like a bit of a peep and tom for a while. So I think <laughs> I think they've cleaned it up a bit since. They um, have. And look, there's loads of activity there, so it's getting a lot of profile and uh, lots of people there at the moment. But we were delighted to uncover it. And you have a few other pieces around the city. Uh, also, another favourite of mine um, is in the in the bodega there on the Colquay and Corn Market Street. That's a beautiful piece of yours there. Yeah, that was a fun one. If any, um, the owner of the bodega contacted me and asked me to do a piece and. Uh, so I came up with the idea of um, Bill McCoy. So he's, uh, Bill McCoy was, uh, we're the saying, the real McCoy came from, he was a, a rum owner. So he, he got the reputation for always having the good, the good rum. Uh, it was never, so he was called Bill, the, the real McCoy. Okay. Um, so that's, that's kind of what he's supposed to be, is that, that rum runner who always had the good stuff. Excellent. Um, I was very yeah. grateful, I mean, I was only 20, seven or eight at the time so to get a chance to do a big lump of marble like that and have a real fun at doing a big piece you know and have it in such a prominent place it's great you know and would there you know from your time in college or even to now would you have any um influences or anyone would have uh, you know shaped yeah. your your aesthetic or your desire to work in stone who influenced you absolutely there's i mean when i was I mean, in crawford there was um P. Joe Sullivan, who's passed away since, was my tutor down there, and he uh, he was a stone carver, as, as was Peter McToy, who was still still making sculpture. But um, because they were both into stone, they kind of showed me a lot of stone sculptures, and it was the British sculptor in the turn of the century, so Jacob Epstein, uh, Henry Godia Beska, um, and then on to Henry Moore, Barbara Hepworth, and quite a few around that kind of time. So it's kind of really between 1850 and 1950 was my main interest in that particular group I, mean, I obviously love Bernini as well it's just mind-blowing I, yes. I went to see his work in Rome and it's just incredible as Katie said it was the first time I'd shut up for more than 10 minutes in a long time <laughs> yeah really those are cool. some uh some wonderful influences I'd be a big fan of Barbara Hepworth's the friends actually uh went to St Ives to visit her studios um oh, a number of years ago so they'd be I, I haven't been yet and I've kind of it's on the list yes it is. list is on pause at the moment like everything else but exactly. I, you know I've got to somewhere I want to get to um, the yeah, school yeah. friends down St Ives yeah an mm. extraordinary part of the world and the Bernard Leach pottery and all of those are down there that I'd love to see but um in your journey James like I know when you were in college you would have 
uh, that's the wonderful thing about going to the Crawford. You have this amazing opportunity of time to explore all kinds of materials. But was there a particular reason that you gravitated to stone? Is, is the materiality? I, or what was when, the, when I went to Crawford, I thought I was going to end up in kind of portrait bronze sculpture kind of thing. I, I really enjoy portraiture and head modeling and stuff. And it's been a long time since I did it. I did a kind of a refresher course, a weekend course up in Leitrim uh, a year or two ago. Uh, it's something I really enjoy, but I, I started stone carving there. I kind of started making models of plaster and carving them, and, and the, the tutors kind of said, well, what about stone? And off I went into the stone carving, and I never turned back. It, it's just, I think it is the physical fun of it and the kind of the energy involved. And I don't make models or maquettes, so I kind of, it's just all part of the process where you just, I have an idea, and I have a piece of stone, and I just get stuck in. And there's a kind of nearly a, I like to say it's like a dance with the stone, but it's probably more of a fight. And it's just trying to push and pull your idea around and find the space in the stone. And, and that's kind of all part of it. And it also informs the final shape as well. Yes. You, you know, sometimes the stone has more shape than you'd like it to, or more say than you'd like it to. Other times, you, you know, you, you dominate the stone a bit more. It doesn't really matter. It's just kind of all part of the, yeah, different stones do different things on, under the chisel, depending on what's happening and how soft they are, how they are, and then, you know, the colour of them. So mar white marble is obviously one of the most common ones. I mean, that's a piece of white marble here. And it's, you know, it's obviously famous because it was Bernini and Michelangelo, but it's just great when it's finished. The whiteness kind of really does show up any the uh, modelling and all that kind of stuff in it. Because the, the limestone, you have to work a bit harder to show up uh, subtleties. Mm. But it is worth it. The Irish limestone is definitely up there. As far as I'm concerned, it's up there with marble for working with. And they're both kind of medium hardness, so they're perfect outdoors, but yes, you can carve them without, you know, water fed diamond tools and machinery and all of that sort of stuff. So and, and is it, when you're when you're choosing a piece of stone for a project, let's say, I mean, what would be the first things that come into your mind? Uh, I mean, I know there's always this idealism, you know, of the finest quality stone an artist can afford. Mm -hmm. but, you know, all of that aside, uh, do, you, do you begin the process with like choosing like a, a dark Kilkenny limestone or a white ashlar limestone? Like, does colours begin the process? A lot of time, a lot of time it, it's kind of a case of uh, you have an idea, mm. you think, you know, you kind of think of it in either limestone or marble mm. or you know or whatever you have around if i have i have a lot of stone around me and i suppose i see it regularly enough so when i have an idea i go oh that'll fit into that block or you know but sometimes you know, i do have an idea and i just think no i have to get i have to go and get you know a piece of marble this size for it but a lot of the time you do I either sometimes i actually bring a block of stone into the workshop and I just leave it up on one of the tables while I'm working on other things. Yeah. And an idea for it will kind of come to me at some point. Yes. Do you find the material kind of might speak to you? Like there is a little bit of interplay. Is there with the it's, material? Yeah, it definitely is. You know, and, and like a lot of the blocks you get are cut, which is great. They're, I mean, they're much easier to, if you've got a flat surface on each side, you can draw on your profiles and all that kind of stuff. But sometimes you get a really nice bit of stone that's just a boulder. And that will already have its own form and shape a little bit in it. And that can really inform. And that, that can be a lot of fun sometimes, but it is. Um, yeah, that's definitely a longer process because you're kind of. You don't have a clear idea. It's, it's a kind of fluid idea that you're moving with. Whereas when I start a piece, I know what I want it to look like at the end, even though I don't do drawings for it. So that it's in my head and I know exactly what I want it to be. You know, and it, it's, I often say to people when you're working like that, you have to know exactly what you want it to look like. Yes. So you exactly what you want to look like and then be prepared to change it at the drop of a hat, you know, as things evolve and move and break and, you know. Yeah. And really. how does stone lend itself to change, really, you know, in the reality? It's a little bit unforgiving. <laughs> it can be quite unforgiving. Yeah. But I mean, I mean, I'm not a, I'm not a stone carver as such. I'm an artist who uses stone. There's a, there's a bit of a difference, but it's, you know, it's important in some ways. And one of the ways is that I, I'm not precious about stone. I'm not precious about if things break and I can fix them with, I mean, with the modern epoxy glues and chemical glues that are out there, mm -hmm. as long as I can get a clean join on it and it's not visible, then I'll, I will do it. Obviously, the challenge is to not break anything when you're making yeah. them in. That's the fun of it. But if it does happen, I don't get precious about it. You know, as long as it doesn't interfere with how the piece looks, then, and, and how, obviously, how it lasts, then I, I don't. 
quibble too much you know you just get on with it yeah, and tell yeah, me six weeks working on something you don't want to break it breaking off a fingernail to be the end of it you know <laughs> <laughs> no that's that's certainly not going to work with your tools and and the the, the size of the work that you that you do uh, the size of the blocks that you have to work into but when when you do get a block and you know you don't do drawings as part of your process I mean we have the block in front of you and you let the material speak to you and you have an idea for it be that something that happens initially or after a long time I mean does it is it a thing that you come to the block and you might you know start with a few pencil lines to start drawing it out or are you going to look at the seam and see what the rock the stone will let you do where does, where does that, what's your first step but sometimes that it, it, there's a bit of both in it i mean sometimes like this piece here beside me um so just there's some water here so it looks very gray and everything so it changes entirely when you wet it and when you polish it so this surfboard this is a 37 inch surfboard and that's going to be polished really black and that changes the look of things completely so i kind of have to have it in my head already what it's going to look like like i have an idea of what this piece here looks like when it's finished yes but when other people other people see it and kind of think sure yeah <laughs> whatever you say <laughs> obviously mental illness in his family so, <laughs> so this is a this this figure is still kind of got a huge amount of waste material on it so he's kind of hard to even make out i'm sure for for you guys at home he's going to have a, a this head arms legs he's going to be quite curved outwards and all of that is in there but i can't see the veins in this block of marble yet because it's only when you start to finish it and sand it so sometimes if you've got like sometimes i've got i've got a block of stone that i'm trying to figure out what to do with mm. i'll um, stand up a piece of it to see what kind of veining is in it okay and then get it and that, that'll help give an idea of what kind of direction or flow might be in there already but sometimes i just put it up in the thing and start working and you know let it let it go from there hey james how like on well, a piece like that and you have this wonderful series of of divers and they you, i know they were commissions for you and they have the fins on them and even the curvature of that piece there like how do you establish where the gravity is on that piece? I mean, everything is heavy and you're working away with it and you're removing a material. Yeah. How do you balance all of that? So it's, it's all it's all visual and it's all... Um, so I, for this, the way, what's kind of inspired me to do this piece was a picture of a surfer called Jerry Lopez. Um, surfers will know who that is. I certainly didn't until a couple of weeks ago. Yeah. And um, it's just his balance on the surfboard is it's it's when you look at it you think he's leaning backwards but it's because of the movement of the surfboard he's leaned back a bit but he's perfectly balanced mm -hmm. and that's what i'm trying to get here so technically speaking when this is finished this figure will be leaning back a little more oh wow and possibly slightly off balance in terms of the actual physical weight but yeah. it should look visually like he's balanced properly on a moving surfboard is the theory now how close and accurate I get to that, I don't know. But you know, that's 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 the end, the idea. That's where you're aiming at. So it's more of it's visual weight, and it's also about momentum and what that does to the body. And and when so, if you want to give the idea of a movement, it'll never really be perfectly balanced like a yoga figure because yeah. it's moving. So if it's a martial arts figure, the weight might be all way over one side through force. So you're given that impression while still being technically grounded by. Your material won't let you do that unless you've got steel pins and all of that kind of stuff. Sure. Um, amateur engineering goes on where you're trying to drill holes and stuff and use epoxy resins and all that to make them balance. And of course, you could do days of work doing that only to make sure it's never seen. And that's, you know, yes. it's often sure. seen. That's the amazing uh, gift and talent I think that you have that you can go through all of these processes from balance and gravity and carving and cutting and all of this technical stuff but you still manage to keep a lot of life in the figure and and that's what yeah. i, I you love have to start at that end you know that's uh, you, you, i start as an artist who's looking at a figure and designing a figure and the weights and balances and compositions and after that you work out how to do it so if you start from the other end um it's a technical exercise in what you can do whereas if you start at the the end goal you go oh, this is what i'm making and now i have to figure out how to make it in stone yes and that's kind of sometimes it works sometimes you, you make an awful mess but if i don't do that you never really push past you know the stone end of it is one thing and i do enjoy the stone carving end i enjoy you know all of the, the dustiness of it and the really kind of 
heavy physical industrial process but at the end of the day i'm making a sculpture and it has to look the way i want it and that's paramount so it doesn't matter whether i'm using stone or plaster or wood or you know or whether i'm drawing or whatever it's it's about that visual it's about that aesthetic thing that i'm after which yeah. i can't even verbalize properly yeah but i think it's, it's a, around an, an intention uh, i feel when i try and identify it for myself it's like when you go to the piece, uh, be it clay or stone, and your intention is to put uh, whatever energy it is into it for you, this part of the surfer and his exquisite balance. I find if you keep that mindful as you work, yeah. that's what kind of translates. You, there's like your head, your hands and your heart. There's three things involved in all of this. And I find for me, if you leave one of them out, the life of the piece just starts to emerge. Yeah, but, yeah. And the same if you start to focus on, like, for example, one of the things that often came up when I was certainly when I was starting was the finish of a stone. Mm -hmm. So getting it flawless and having no scratches and no kind of uh, marble, for example, bruises. And I think when you hit it too hard, it pulverizes underneath. So when you polish it, you have these really bright white spots. Oh, and people get, you know, oh, you should carve those out. You know, but if you carve them out, you're carving the surface down, you're changing the surface. So mm -hmm. then it becomes what's more important. Am I making a sculpture or a pretty piece of stone? Yes. So for years, I didn't bother polishing anything at all. I just kind of left it relatively, you know, sanded down, but relatively rough. Yeah. Just because I don't want, you know, it's, it's not about the stone. It's, I happen to use stone and I love it, but it's, it's about that composition. And, and as I say, the balance and the, the small things that make a difference. And if, if you take out too many of these so-called imperfections, one, you change the shape and it can change it dramatically in some instances but more importantly you, you make it look like a machine finished yes. thing you take some of the life the energy mm -hmm. out of it and those two words that you use actually energy and intent mm -hmm. are the two kind of really important driving forces when you're making expressive art i think it's that you know because there's a lot of a lot of art out there and it's it's very pretty and it's beautiful and all but it's not it doesn't really speak to people exactly. it doesn't really hit people anywhere it's just a beautiful object yes that's not what i make i suppose well, no, nor I. And I mean, it can be technically accomplished and it can be beautiful. But to marry the two, I think that's what you have that yeah, ability. Exactly. That's, that's kind of where, where we try to aim. We do. Yes, so we do indeed. And like uh, in this whole um, this process, and I see some tools on the on your uh, your banker there, your bench beside you. I mean, these are the extension of our hands and the tools of the trade. Mm -hmm. Obviously, so are, holding something very, uh, a, a very modern and contemporary piece of, uh, I'd say, air pressure it hydraulic is, bit there. But you have a pneumatic hammer, so it is an air yeah. hammer. But, mm. uh, modern, I suppose, relatively speaking, but the, the oldest one that they know of that's still working is 100 years old. So, so like, that, that's the oldest one still, still in service. Now, obviously, I'm sure they've refined them a lot since. But essentially what they are is a chair power comes in through the hose and there's a small piston within this mm. and, a, and a gap. So the piston just goes back and forward. Your chisel goes into it and it strikes the, the chisel for you. Okay. So importantly, it's still your hands doing the same, shaping the stone and doing directing the chisel. You're just uh, not using as much force because your hands. So obviously at some point I end up down with, usually at the start and the end, you end up with hammer and chisel. Okay. Yeah, that's at the end you end up with these very fine chisels and it's just tapping away and um so i mean these are all different there's, there's infinite varieties of weights and shapes of hammers and so but really a hammer is a hammer okay a chisel, but there are infinite varieties of each yeah. um and obviously like any other profession or hobby when you get into tools the sky's the limit you can have yeah. five and still do a sculpture that's great or you can have 50 and still not make anything of worth so it's you know um, yes and it's another rabbit hole to fall down isn't it buying tools and i mean would you would you ever make your own tools for example or i don't i don't actually yeah i do, I do remember them trying to teach me how to make them <laughs> in the crawford college yes, between, yeah. like, between tom white and dennis Lynch. they did try desperately to make me a, a metal worker and i wasn't <laughs> Um, the, the thing about it is that the, the tungsten is what I use mostly, tungsten chisels. So there, there's kind of at the tip of each of these chisels, hard. it's normal steel, and at the tip there's a, a very hard metal at the top, and you just can't make them yourself. You know, you need to uh, engineering stuff to do that. 
Yes. So I don't I don't make them myself. I prefer to, to buy them. A little bit about uh, your trip to Italy. You went to Carrera to investigate oh, the marble yeah. quarries and look into that aspect of our wonderful uh, sculpture history. Gone. We decided we'd go on a family holiday, so I picked Italy, and we went. Let's be fair, we went to Luca as well, and then Pietro Santo is just amazing. And Pietro Santo is, is kind of the stone historically, and, and now a stone processing area. So the quarry could get quarried out of the varying quarries around Carrara and around the hills of Pietro Santo. Comes into Pietro Santo, all the massive stone yards, and the old historical village in Pietro Santo is beautiful, but it's very kind of upmarket and. All of that. Carrara is a much older town mm. and it's the carvers and it's got tool shops and all of that kind of stuff. Um, so it's not as fancy as Pietro Santa, but it is kind of historically the heart of, of Italian marble. So I just I took a, I, I, we were at Pietro Santa for a week and uh, during that I just took a, a day trip on my own up to see the Carrara Hills, just to see the, the literal mountains of white of marble and you're looking at them thinking they're huge and then you realize the tiny little dot is, is actually a, a huge truck an excavator and it's okay. kind of this and you see the trucks snaking down the mountains loaded with 20 tons of, of blocks of stone it's just it's just a beautiful thing to to see um I mean, it's a beautiful place for anyone to see but obviously with, with when you have an interest in stone and and marble and the history of you know where michelangelo would have got a stone there and all of that kind of stuff yeah, and, uh, and Canova, as we related back to Crawford and our wonderful casts and things, you do have uh, an exhibition coming up. But I mean, before you tell me about that, how are opportunities on the ground at the moment? Uh, it's it's surprisingly good. I mean, you know, like everyone else, you're trying to pick this, you'll find the silver linings and between extra family time and all of that kind of stuff that's the going. It's been quite good. And then um, an interesting thing has happened as well. The, Irish, I suppose every every country, but Ireland relative to us is looking inwards. So rather than trying to get the fancy things from abroad, they're trying to find them from Ireland instead. So and people are spending money on gardens, which is great for sculptors because they want a nice piece of art to you know conversation piece and all of that for the garden. And so I've done quite well. I've done you know we won't be I won't be retiring young and handsome, but uh, <laughs> you know, done That's quite you. well. Good. I can't you know can't complain. Um, great. Can't complain. Um, great. And, uh, and this exhibition coming up is, uh, we still don't know whether it's going to be physical, open, or whether it's going to be virtual because it's next month. So it's unlikely yeah. to be open for all of it at least, you know, and we might be so, getting some days. But... Tell me now, that's in just to, to share with the friends. So that is in the Gallery of Modern Art in Waterford, right? They call it Goma. Goma, Waterford, yeah. yeah. And it's with uh, Dennis Lynch. And I can see one of Dennis's pieces in the background there. Yes, that's it. <laughs> on the windowsill. On yes. the windowsill. So yeah, myself and Dennis did a show together in 2017. But I think it's the 8th of April. Of April. And most likely for four weeks then, with a bit of luck. That's, yeah. um, the rest of the year, anything else planned um, for the friends? Uh, maybe a little more local access? Uh, would you be... 40 or 50 sculptures down in Ballymaloo Gardens for the summer. So it, it'll open mid-June I think it opened somewhere on the 17th or thereabouts so that'll, yeah, that'll be a good one and that's on your doorstep yes oh, and um your agent there if anyone wants to get in touch is that RS sculpture Richard Scott sculpture or Richard how sculptures Valley Malou yeah and, and Saul, Saul Art Gallery up in, in Dublin as well I've started showing and selling with them yeah. Well, exactly. Jane, thanks so much for your morning and for this lovely uh, little preview. It's like I'm looking in the camera here, trying to see more of your studio and what's around that corner. And so, oh, yeah. well, it's, mess, it's mess and dust. No, it's wonderful to see. So, thank you for in, inviting me or letting me invite myself <laughs> and the friends into your studio. Oh, yeah. You're welcome. Thanks for thanks for talking to me. Not at all. My pleasure. And and uh, the friends can see more of you in Goma in April and out in Ballymaloo during the summer. Yeah, and man, get in touch with you at James Horan Sculpture if they if they would like to see more of your work. And that's your website too. You have a gallery. JamesHoranSculpture.com. Yeah. Okay. Super. James, thanks a million. Enjoy Thank the rest of your morning.